Hi, I'm John Lemon. I'm a live sound engineer. I'm a studio engineer. I work around the world, I live around the world, and I spend a lot of time in a plane. I've been at it for a long time, so it goes back a fair while. I've worked with acts like Level 42, The Cure, Depeche Mode, then more recently, you know, Nine Inch Nails, Ray LaMontagne, Beck, Lana Del Rey, and I'm currently on tour with Sia. Well, analog for me, living in Australia was pretty basic because the import duties were so high that it was local companies who made everything. So, you know, we'd only read in magazines in the late 70s and 80s of, you know, what was going on overseas. Uh, consequently, I sort of found out that it wasn't that much difference. Everybody was kind of learning and making it up as they go, apart from a few geniuses along the way. Um, but really, then sort of moving forward through the 80s in the UK, uh, using some of the famous British consoles was fantastic live. An early 90s digital effects unit started to come in, the Roland SD3000 and then some of the Lexicon stuff, the, you know, I guess 80s as well with the uh, 224, I think. I was always so interested in those. I, I sort of made the most of them that I could with analog gear. Then when MIDI came in to use live more and you could change from song to song, that was sort of a great thing. So I was always interested in pushing it forward. Um, and I clearly remember, I'm, I'm guessing it was the early 2000s when the Max BCL, the first piece of hardware came out that I'd use with an analog console. But it was kind of like, wow, this Waves thing is pretty good. I hadn't, I wasn't a Pro Tools user much at all then. It was just a big tape machine if I was doing live albums. Um, so that was a sort of a piece that moved forward. And then I suppose around 2003, I got involved with Digico and I had the first, I had a prototype of the D5 along with uh, Lars Brogard had one as well. And I started to realise I could really now start seeing the vision of what the digital world could do for us in the live world in terms of changing scenes, song to song, and really doing things differently. And, you know, I, at the time I was working for Beck and I remember saying to him, look, I've got this digital console. It might break down in the middle of the set, but we can change the reverbs from song to song and the delays and it's all programmable and EQ. And he was like, yeah, I'm fine with it. And because it did break down a few times because it was the early days and probably my finger got in the way of things as well. But now having, you know, used digital consoles for some 13 years, I, there's just no way I could go back. And I think going back to when I've first got a sound grid, which was probably 2009 or eight, in my apartment in Chicago. I was living in America then and an SD10 turned up and this sound grid. And I could start using plugins I'd used on live records, like um, for the, from the Fragility Tour with Nine Inch Nails, they really introduced me to mixing in a studio with plugins. Um, and it was just great. It was this sort of exciting moment of, wow, I can use an SSL comp on my bus, my master bus, you know, and I, having used lots of SSLs on different live records and that centre part of the console, it was just great. And it was exciting. And now that it's all sort of got so stable over the last five years, it's, it now has just completely changed. I can't even imagine going back to analog and I know some guys love using it and of course it's got its place and it sounds fantastic. But I think with a lot of analog emulations as well, like the NLS channels and the NLS bus, you get a lot of that non-linearity now and that's terrific. You know, I, I just love it, got to say, just love it. I think I really sort of understood the plug-in thing around 99, 2000, when I was working on the 5.1 version of Nine Inch Nails Fragility Live DVD. And all the guys in Trent's studio were just into it. They could use any plug-in of course, Waves was one of the real main manufacturers at that point and everybody looked at it with reverence. And 
I just thought, oh, well, you know, I'll just use a bit of outboard. But the more I got into mixing that record, the more I realised the value, I think, of an L1 to level things out, whether it be on individual channels or... And it opened my eyes and I started to think, wow, this would be great to use live, wouldn't it? It'd be terrific, you know. But there was no way to do that really back then. But the more I went into studios to do live records, the more I employed plugins. And then one day I was at the PA company in England, I think Britannia Row, and Waves had sent a Max BCL. And I realised, wow, this is a, I think it's a Renaissance compressor, the Max Bass and the L2. It's like, okay, so I can use that, you know, with my analog system and then on to using it with my D5. And then really, as a hardened Digico user, it was when the SD8 came out, I think, and there, the, and there was the, the sound grid and all those possibilities I'd been thinking of for years or using in the studios in the early 2000s sort of became available to me and it's become so solid now. I actually don't even use any analog outboard anymore at all. I think, you know, there's enough emulations out to give me any sort of graininess, distortion that I need. Um, the only piece of outboard that I actually ever use now, and I've still, I don't think I've done a show without it in 10 years, is the Max BCL is always beside me, just for extra tweaking on my master bus. Favourite plugins of mine, well, I don't know where to start really because I started writing out a list earlier and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm going to go to the real fundamentals that I love using, especially with digital consoles. There's always something, they're great, but there's always something clinical about them. So the first place I'll start on my master, I'll put an NLS bus on there. I do a lot of group mixing these days um, because I, I, I'll find I'll have say it's with Lana Del Rey, I'll have a, a drum group, a bass group, guitar group, backing vocal group, her group. All of those I'll have NLS channels on. And I, I'll flip between the three different settings on them, add a little bit of drive for a bit of grit, but it gives me that non-linearity that a digital console just doesn't give you automatically and gives you a little bit of analogue warmth. Um, so that would be where I always start. But a vocal chain, for example, to me, I've, I've got really quite stuck now. And a lot of this is because of what I do in the studio now, you know, mixing pop records or rock records in Australia or for people overseas. Um, my vocal chain now would be NLS, straight into an Rvox, straight into a C6. And that has become a real classic for me now. And I know it is for a, a lot of great engineers as well. But I've worked out the presets that suit me across the board pretty well generally. And I can jump from, you know, Alana Del Rey to a Seer with a basic template, or even the other day I mixed a, remixed a old Oasis track for a new album release, anniversary release they're doing. I use the same, chain Rvox and C6 setting I'd been using on other records and live and it just dropped in and his voice just came to life so that's a, a real mainstay for me on the vocal. Um, master bus wise as I said NLS bus usually just straight into the SSL comp it just glues everything together and we all I think live and studio engineers just love that plug and it's just it's great. Same thing actually with drums, with if I'm using live drums, I always have a parallel compression bus. Always I use the SSL, it's my favorite and we all have our favorite settings to just give more impact to the drums. That's another favorite for me. Guitars these days, can't do it without NLS and Renaissance Axe, the world's greatest guitar plugin without a doubt. Just always use that. As well as those fundamental plugins that I always use on, you know, vocals, bass guitar, actually, I didn't say again, NLS and the CLA 76, another fabulous plugin that uh, couldn't get a bass guitar sound without these days. And I also use the CLA 76 quite a lot on vocals, depends on the vocalist. I'll swap between the Rvox and the CLA 76. Um, effects wise, I'm fairly simple with effects, but I think the best 
plug-in delay out there for me anyway is the H delay and I've been using it since day one that it came out because it's so simple to put in your tempos or, or you know feedback song to song snapshots just a beautiful sound can make it analog it can make it clean love that to death and of course now in the last eight months I guess the H reverb which has lifted the whole standard of plug-in reverbs so high that I don't bother using those very expensive outboard reverbs anymore. I can just keep it on, it on board, whether it be drums, vocals, just a little bit of room for guitars, whatever, it, fabulous plug-in. And really they're the effects that I mostly stick to now. And I you know, just have multiple instances of them and I can make them sound like different things. Well, I use the real ADT with Lana a little bit as well for a sort of 60s kind of feel. Um, yeah, one of the great plugins actually, as is the J37, thinking about it, and the, the Kramer tape I use quite a bit. I use the Kramer tape and the doubler quite often. I can get a fantastic classic uh, harmonizer effect out of that, and I use that a lot on backing vocals actually. An extension of the NLS modeling, I think, is also what's coming out now in terms of some of the old Abbey Road gear. I've been employing a lot of that stuff when I'm especially mixing at home and depending on what artist I'm doing as well, I, I throw that into my arsenal live as well. I think, you know, one, two, three, four, five, the TG, one, two, three, four, five. I love, I'm a big, big fan of the Abbey Road plate at the moment. Obviously I'll use that more at home. Yeah, it's exciting. Modeling, modeling is exciting. On tour with Sia, is much different to being with Lana Del Rey. I've been jumping between both artists at the moment. So one is a real band, like a full band with Lana Del Rey. And with Sia, it's much more a performance art piece. So we took all the original mix sessions and it's presented to me like a band, but I wanted to sort of warm that up a bit. So with Sia, again, I, I do a lot of group mixing uh, at times I can have sort of 60 tracks coming at me, so I get it down to about a dozen groups. Again, I always use the NLS on them, uh, dual basses. I'll be sw switching between a Renaissance comp and a uh, CLA 76, for example, on the, the basses. Some of them are keyboard basses, some of them are real basses. So it helps me to be able to snapshot, to go snapshot to snapshot and change between those two different styles of compressors. But I do find myself still going back to my favourites with Sierra and her different mic positions. I was still going NLS, Rvox, uh, into my C6 and I have a setting for her and I'd be happy to put that preset up because it seems to work for a lot of people. Um, and also there are backing vocal tracks, um, you know, all the harmony stuff, Sierra, everything's live from her main vocal all the time. Um, but I've found there that sort of interesting because I don't necessarily use my normal chain. Uh, I always have the NLS on there, but I, I, I seem to, to want to warm that up a bit. So I often run that through Kramer tape and then into a compressor, whether it be R Vox or CLA 76, depends what song it is. And that just holds, holds those backing vocal tracks together for me and actually makes it more like the record. Other than that, it, it is fairly straightforward. You know, we all use the tools we like to use, whether it be live or in the studio. And once you are very familiar with those plugins, it's very easy to move around and get to where you want to be quickly. One of the weird things I do, I know lots of people do sort of weird things, and we all go a bit off the beaten way to, you know, try and get a better sound or we're looking for something that we can't get. And I, I realised recently, actually, with um, on Lana's tour, had a great snare drum sound, but there was something missing. So, and I've done it in the studio before where I just pulled the fabulous Renaissance axe, which I just use on every guitar I ever touch these days. I put one over on the snare and it, I was just looking for that extra fatness and holding it into the mix a bit more. And for me, it's just sort of one of the great tricks that you can really compress it hard and heavy and it just holds the snare right into the mix. So it's sort of a bit weird, but you know, we all try different things. As well as doing front of house live for a long time, I've also done a lot of studio 
live studio albums through the 90s in particular and into the 2000s, and I still do. Of course, in the 90s, it was mostly, you know, using an SSL or a Neve, great fun, it'd be quite time consuming as well. Running video, chasing the tapes of the video. And by the 2000s, um, starting to use DAWs to play back and some plugins, but I was still using analog consoles. Um, and now I think, you know, maybe in the last, in particular, seven, eight years, really everything being DAW based and having plugins sort of available to you that you use all the time that I can take settings from now over into the live world and vice versa. I can be doing the live show. We know we're going to shoot, you know, do a video of it and then mix it later. I can just take some of the settings from the plugins and drop them straight into the DAW, Pro Tools, Logic, whatever it is. So what I've really found now in the last again, six, seven years, with the way technologies are converging and the true, truly advanced sound systems and line arrays, that there's everything's converged to me. So for me, it's very easy to step out of doing the live show and somebody saying, okay, we need content for our website now. Can you mix three tracks? from the last show and we can put them up tomorrow. And I can have templates set up, know exactly the reverbs, the delays I was using on my console, just drag them over onto Pro Tools and there you go. So I, th I think more and more the convergence has sort of arrived basically. So it's a real gray line between the two things. I know a lot of studio engineers probably wouldn't agree with that, but I also know a lot who primarily do studio, who now want to have a go at doing live shows. And we see that more and more, and that's just a fantastic advancement. And in particular, you start to choose the plugins that you want to take, or that you know work in the studio and live, no matter what happens, you know, certain compressors, Rvoxes, C6s, you see them in use everywhere now. What I like about today's world is the fact that I can do a show on a Friday night, go back to the hotel room, have a listen to it. I've recorded it on Tracks Live. Start playing around with some plugins that I've been, or effects in particular, I suppose, in my headphones in the hotel room, get something sort of perfectly right for a certain part of a song. And I just export it, ex you know, save, save the, um, preset onto a USB key, go back to my console the next day, and there I have exactly that setting loaded up for that song. And I do, I find myself doing it more and more. I was sitting on a plane the other day, and I hadn't liked the last show we did with Sia. There was just something I wasn't liking on her vocal. Set up my laptop, and I just wanted to really hone in on the C6 I, and I just sat there for about 15 minutes on the plane. It's like, oh, that's the frequency I just wanted to get rid of at a certain level. Saved it as a uh, vocal preset C6. Got to the show the next day, straight into the Digico console and it was just perfect. I was right on the money. It was great. And I do that with so many plugins now, whether it's H delay, H reverb, um, Renaissance acts, whatever. I love the fact that we can move them between the multi rack, Pro Tools, Logic, whatever, and the console you're using. Greg Kirsten, who you know has produced Sears albums, I've met him. Well, I've worked with him with Beck actually in the past, and uh, Jesse. Everybody was very open when we were putting the music together to help me achieve the finished record sound. Um, and that's what Sia wanted. She wanted to sound like the record. One of the real interesting things about putting together the music for the Sia tour was getting some of the older, or, or getting the sessions from whoever had mixed the sessions. And um, I was astounded to see a song come up from Manny and his plugins were there. There was Triple D, there was a reverb, and of course I jumped to have a look at the settings that were there. 
and it just astounded me and really sort of, it made me feel great that seeing that the guys that Waves helped develop some of their classic chains uh, of, of gear and model, that guys like Manny are out there using them, that really blew me out. I, I was sort of excited to see that and made me realise, I'm sure, I guess that happens all the way through, with, you know, from the CLA stuff to uh, Manny, all, all those uh, modellings are just fantastic. And, and it makes me realise that I've just taken those settings and I'm using them in the live sphere, you know, whether it be on Sears Vogue or, or whatever, whatever. So there's this sort of complete consistency across the board now to me between the studio and live. And I love that we can do that in the modern era and it's only going to happen more and more. I think it's one of the great things now with the consistency we can get between our work in the studio and our live work, you know, between studio rack, sound grid, mouldy rack. I can just move things around everywhere and it just, it, it gives me a consistency to the sound I like. And I think it gives the artists I work with a consistency, whether I'd be mixing something for their website or for a live video or at the show. That's a terrific thing to have the ability to do now. I find it interesting now that um, doing both disciplines, live and studio, how much with modern PAs and the ability to work in the box at home in your own studio, uh, as long as it's a controlled environment, I think. Um, it's become a lot easier. I, you know, at one point, sort of 10, 15 years ago, I would have approached, you know, mixing a live record completely differently to how I do the live show. Whereas now I find though both things converging much more because of the, you know, we have so much coherency in our, with our you know, modern line arrays, as well as all the abilities we have in our bot and to work in the box quickly. Um, and just get through things. So again, you know, I'm saying I, I can take settings from the live situation and quickly put them into my studio remix of that live song for a website or whatever. And yeah, that bass guitar compression is going to work for me or it's only a minor tweak that'll make it sit in the speakers or the computer speakers or the, you know, monitors I'm listening to. And same with, you know, delays and reverbs where I really did used to approach them so differently, but now it sort of feels like I'm on a cross-platform almost more and more, and I love the fact you can do that. Can't stay.